Good to see each of you. I ask you to open your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, pardon me. If you're looking at the board and say, that's not what it says up there, that's right. Well, it's where we'll start in beginning as we review just a little bit. But the new territory will start over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. It'd be inappropriate if I started without noting the fact that we've lost two dear ladies, two sisters in Christ in the past week, and we miss them and will continue to do so greatly. Rowena Legg and Dolores Craig, of course, have passed from this life. We uh, learned a great deal from them. They were good examples, godly women. They loved the Lord. They loved their family, they love the family of God, and uh, that's the best you can say about anyone, and that truly was there with them. We give our sympathies to the families and uh, extend to them every way of trying to help. During times of turmoil like this, during times where we are bereaved, those of us who have been there in losing parents or others that are very close to us, recognize how much it is that our brethren can strengthen us and how much it is that we can receive encouragement from one another, and certainly that's what we need to do. This morning I want to continue a series that I hadn't preached on in several weeks, and that's why I'm going to go back and deal with some of these principles as we introduce it and then go on to some other territory. As I do this, I want to make a couple of statements out front. And number one is that the elders did not tell me to preach this sermon. It's not something where I've been instructed. I'm going to uh, suggest you'll find out why I'm saying that. It's not any matter where I believe any of us would be surprised of uh, what is going to be said. We've discussed these things before, sometimes at great length, sometimes at lesser length. But the fact is I'm very concerned about the problems that take place with regard to the unity in any congregation. And certainly it is my desire that that unity that we have here continue to exist. Long before I came here, the 84th Street congregation was known not only for a soundness of faith, but a love for one another. That's discussed many times in prayers and stated And I want to say that that is there not because of me at all. Phil Arnold, who was here before me, was a man of love and love for God and for his people. And he was one who was of strength in that way. But I think mainly we look at the elders when we see an example of strength in the will of God and in love for one another and helping one another. And that certainly has been present in this congregation. And I pray that it continues. But I notice that we have problems that come up from time to time. And we have our problems here that need to be dealt with from time to time. Some of them that are necessary. In other words, things that have to do with the will of God that we must contend earnestly for and some that are unnecessary on matters of opinion. And that's what we want to look at as we talk about this lesson today and center in on. So I asked you to open your Bibles Look at the things that are said. Examine them from God's Word. Nothing is right because it comes from this pulpit or any other. It's right because it's found in the Word of God. And that's the standard by which we're judged. I recognize that as I stand, it's that standard of judgment that is there for me. It's one thing to stand before people and uh, give an answer for the things that I teach. It's another thing that I recognize that that answer must come to God as well. That I stand before God and I must answer to Him for the way I deal with His Word is something that is indeed sobering to me every time that I stand in this place. As we looked at the ideas presented in Ephesians chapter 4, the points that we are very clear in in verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, 
we recognize that oneness is speaking of the fact that we have unity in those facts, those principles or foundations that are there coming from God's Word. Just as those are clear and they are things that we can unite on, he also points out we need to unite together on the others. As he starts out in verse 1, he talks about the fact that he's a prisoner of the Lord, but even though he's a prisoner of the Lord, he's concerned about the things of the body of Christ, that the right kind of truth is carried on and in the right attitudes. That's the point that's made, really, when it comes there to verse 3, and this is what we've been dealing with in the previous two lessons, that that unity is of the Spirit. It's defined by the Holy Spirit, defined by God in His Word, in other words. That Spirit gave the Word, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired of God. And that's how it came about. God, therefore, laid down the parameters of that unity, but we must be those who carry on that unity that God provided in a kind of an attitude of looking to one another and seeking peace with one another before God. When we talk about that unity of the Spirit, as we pointed out, we point that that unity is provided for by the Spirit. That's given to us in God's Word. And as we join together in an obedience of God's Word, then what happens? We have that unity that's provided for, that same action that's provided for through the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's a part of that doctrine of Christ. Then when we talk about that unity of the Spirit being carried on in the bond of peace, we noted the fact that that means that we must be of service to one another and to the cause of Christ. That we recognize we must sacrifice ourselves. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter what's best for me. What we think about is the fact that we are indeed servants of Jesus Christ. As you see those three passages, Colossians 3, Philippians 2, and also 1 Peter chapter 3, you recognize in all of them attitudes are discussed as far as what's necessary for us to control our mind, the thing that's behind our action coming from. That mind is changed to an instruction or a direction given by the unity of the Spirit in the will of God. But that unity of the Spirit is carried on in the bond of peace. How? As we have those characteristics, those attitudes that are there of serving not self, but first God, and then one another as well. So you have that plan laid out there that there is a unity that's found, directed by God, that we must carry on. And what you have in the next part of the chapter from verses 11 to 16, is merely an application of that practice. That God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Well, why did He give those? For the work that has to do with the will of God. And what is that work?
is that going to happen in practical terms? Verse 16 points out, from whom, in other words, from Christ and from his revelation of truth, from whom the whole body, and get this, as it's given a picture of a body that's here. This whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What is the point of that? The point is that that unity does not depend on just a few people. That unity and growth and continuance of God's will depends on every single member of the body. That every single part does its share. Now my share isn't yours and yours isn't mine. I don't have the responsibility of being an elder and they don't have the responsibility I have as an evangelist. But we each have our place that God has given and when we do that and carry on that place, then what happens? The truth is taught. It's taught more fully and people grow up in that and they're able to carry the truth to others. There you've got it. That's the unity that is being discussed in a broad form. That's our job. That's what God expects us to do. And when instead of carrying on that truth and teaching that and causing others to grow in the understanding of the doctrine of Christ, when instead of that we have our own petty personal problems, then we got a problem, you see. Those need to be addressed because why? They affect the unity. On the other hand, if there's somebody out here and they're teaching a different doctrine, now what happens? That has to be addressed. Why? Because that is what is dangerous to that unity and the basis of it of the will of God, the doctrine of Christ. You see the point that's being made? All of this fits together. Now, that's fine in theory, but now what else happens? What else happens is we got little problems that come along that sometimes don't have to do with the revealed truth but have to do with matters of opinion. And that's where we want to turn our attention this morning. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, how do you identify those and how do you deal with them properly by the will of God? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's start with verse 14. As we start there, the writer says, remind them of these things. Paul talking to the evangelist Timothy. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babbling, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now I want to examine that passage for just a little bit, if I might. He says we're not to strive about words. The word that's used there from the original language is a word that starts out with those first four letters we notice, logo. We know logos is word. That's what Jesus is called in John chapter 1. In other words, he's the very exegete or the expression of God. He is God's word in human flesh. Now, that word is then combined with one that really talks about contending or disputing. So what's the point of that? The point of that, it implies a dispute over trivial things, something that has to do with mere words. I want you to notice what's said in Titus chapter 3 and in verse 10. In Titus 3 and in verse 10, Paul says to another evangelist, Titus, reject a divisive man after the first or second admonition. That idea of a divisive man is much the same thing. It has to do with one who is 
teaching that which only causes factions, a splitting apart after different ideas that are there. Well, is everybody that causes a contention a sinner? Well, no, because I know in Jude 3 the point is made, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I was constrained to write to you telling you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He goes on there and points out that in that time there were those who were speaking a doctrine that had differed from the will of God. And he says to those who he was teaching, Jude at this time, you need to go out there and contend for what's right. Don't sit by and let the doctrine of Christ be dragged through the mud and changed because you need to stand up for it. Well, we've got one guy up here who's contending... And he's one that we're to divide from, that we're to mark after the second, or first and second admonition. In other words, you do it pretty quickly. Don't allow him to continue on in that factious behavior. And you've got one where this contending is something that is demanded. What's the difference? When you look at that, it's obvious there has to be something. It's not just contending that's wrong. So what is wrong? What is the problem that we have? The point is there's a difference in the contending. What is the point of that contending? Is it something that has to do with the word of truth? Or is it something that has to do with that which is merely a kind of a contending about disputes that are semantic in nature? I want to take you back up to the top of that page. Look at that word that is there, logomachio. The idea is the words contending over mere words. You ever heard some people talk about, well, you know, it's just a matter of semantics. You say it this way, I say it that way. It's not a, any different. Well, sometimes that's true. And if that is true, that we're talking about the same thing in principle, we're using different words for it, that's a useless dispute. But a lot of times people talk about, well, you know, some of these disputes that these preachers have had, just over semantics. And we're talking about whether Christ kept his deity while he came in the flesh. No, sir, that is not a matter of mere semantics. That's a matter of doctrine. And we need to recognize the difference between the two. If I'm going to come along and I'm going to just give a different word and say, you need to use my word, not your word. Well, wait a second. Why? If they're both pointing out the same thing. God's word was translated out of one language into several, and God still saw it as his word. So I can use that word and change it to another that is a synonym, and there's no problem in that as long as it accurately describes that truth. But when it does not and it changes the very function of God's will, when it changes the very principle that's involved, there we have a problem that needs to be addressed. We're not to strive about words. And he also says to no profit. That word profit talks about something that's useful, beneficial, that's advantageous. In other words, it does some good. That's the profit that's there. So if he says you don't strive about words to no profit, we're talking about differences that don't make a difference ultimately either way. That don't make us the better spiritually Avoiding sin and doing what is right makes no difference which of the two are followed. Instead, he says, you don't have these discussions of words to no profit, but when you do, what does it do? It overthrows the faith of some. He says Hymenaeus and Philetus are a good expression of that. That word uh, overthrow talks about being a subversive or about a ruin that happens, a destruction that takes place. As a matter of fact, most of the time it's talked about as destruction. The Greek word itself, if you look at it there, is it's anglicized in the uh, word catastrophe is what you get. We understand what a catastrophe is. Have we seen people who are spiritual catastrophes? Yeah. What happened? Their faith was taken away and they went off in a different direction. That may be because they followed a different doctrine. 
Maybe because they followed the world in worldly ways and sinful actions. Or it may be that they were so concerned about some opinion of theirs that they stressed that and tried to bind that and as a result of that started concentrating on their ways rather than God's ways. And that's the point. If I start binding things that are not a matter of sin and righteousness and I demand that everybody follow my idea of this, then what happens? What I'm actually doing is I'm being more destructive. Typically, when I deal with people like this, we have them, and you know it and I know it. Anytime you're among more conservatively minded brethren, you're going to have somebody that has the idea, well, conservative means we're restrictive. And so if we give more restrictions, we're more conservative. Wrong. Conservative means to conserve to keep a pattern. And the pattern that's given is God's Word. I am not conservative when I add restrictions that God did not add. I am one who is disregarding the pattern. And whether I do that to the left or the right, it does not matter. It's the same point. We need to keep hold of that pattern of truth and not change it one way or the other. Let me give an example of this in closing. Let's say that what I want to do is I want to deal with some things and I look at it and I say, you know, there's a problem here and I just don't like the custom that started. I'll give you a case of a custom that I don't like. But it's not a matter of doctrine. I always grew up with women who were wearing dresses to services. I tell you what, I kind of like that. My wife does that. But if I come along and say, you know, that, that kind of a custom that's there, I'm going to demand that, and if you're really going to be spiritual, you got to wear a dress, lady. If you don't, we're not going to accept you. Now, where would I go for that? Typically what happens is that you find many of those people who will go over to the Old Testament, and they'll say, well, you shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man, a woman should. Well, that passage is perverted if it's used in that way. It's talking about the regulation that has to do with restrictions of a place. And the putting on of that which belonged to a man was the putting on of that where that man is the one who alone had that job that came with that. For instance, an ephod to a priest or some garment that was of royalty unto a king. And the woman was not to wear that. Why? Because she didn't have that place. You see, if I start trying to regulate our customs by a misuse of Scripture, i got a problem. I've added to God's Word. But then if I say, well, then clothing doesn't matter. You can wear whatever you want. God doesn't have any restriction on that at all. Women just have at it. Now, wait a minute. Both women and men need to understand there is a restriction. It has to do with the modesty that is there. That we not be those who show that which is of shame, the revealing of the flesh. You see, I can take that too far one way or another. On the one hand, I can lose any restriction that God did give with regard to modesty. On the other, I can add to God's word by restricting after the things that have to do only with customs. That many times is what happens as we recognize those kind of additions and subtractions that are made. Mistakes go in both ways there. Striving without a cause has always been that which has been rejected by God. I want you to think about the fact that needless controversy or needless fighting is something that God has talked about along with the idea of what a Christian's charge is. We're to fight the good fight of faith. That demands a militant action. To fight is something that is militant. But if we're fighting about things we shouldn't be fighting about, that's foolishness, as God points it out. Look in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 30, the statement is made that you do not strive with a man without cause. 
that you don't go hastily to court with him. You consider these things. Be sure of your ground. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he talked about causing disputes. Some things do that, whereas some things cause edification. Which should I be doing? He tells Timothy, you need to be involved in causing edification. The building up in the word of God, not that which causes division or strife or dispute. I've seen not a lot. I've seen a few people who seem to like fights and like disputes. I've had my share of them, both controversy publicly and privately. You know what? I hate them. It's not a matter that I'm just not really fond of it. I absolutely hate it. It gives my stomach the kind of a problem that's been there, and that's exactly what I've had for several months now. As I've seen little things start tearing up various congregations across the country over matters that shouldn't be there. I hate disputing. I've got to do it at times when it deals with what's necessary to build up in the faith. But when I start having the idea that somehow conservatively-minded people will argue all the time and have fusses and fights all the time in order to pr uh, prove that we're conservative, i got a wrong concept of conservative and I've got a wrong concept of what God demanded. That's something that's not there in the truth. In Titus chapter 3, there are foolish questions, strife, contention that need to be avoided. We read verse 10 a few minutes ago that the one who's causing that, you be one who recognizes a factious man, you reject after the first and second admonition. In other words, you do that quickly so that that cancer doesn't spread. For in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we avoid few foolish questions and ignorant disputes that are there. All of these passages point us to the fact that we must never stir conflict and cause strife and have a lack of love for one another, but rather a love of that strife. Like I said, I've seen a few people who seem to like that, not very many. But if that's the attitude that's there, I need to sit back and think. If I have a history, repeatedly, of being involved in one thing after another that causes strife, in one place after another where there's been a dealing of strife and division, instead of a long-term kind of an attitude that I'm working together to try to produce the truth in every man's mind, to get that to be kept there, but to band together, had a fellow one time who was a preacher. I was in the Houston area, and I joined with some guys one day to go down for lunch, and a bunch of those preachers were there, and this man got uh, at the table, and he says, well, I'll tell you what. I'm one of those fellows that if you put me into a congregation of 200, in six months I'll have them down to 45 and do some fighting weight then. I looked at him and I said, why didn't you take about three years and build them up to 300? That's not something I'd brag about, of being able to divide a church. That's not the point. The point is to cause people who are weak to be stronger, to build them up, and they'll go out and cause others to be stronger. That idea of let's get them down to a fighting weight suggests that's all we're doing is fighting. And I tell you what, that's what will happen if that's what the concept is. But what we need to do is not love that, but love the fact that we need to be building. Little building is done in the midst of war. That's a fact physically, and that's a fact spiritually as well. And we need to understand that sometimes it's necessary, but it's not something that should ever be the preferred course of action. In Romans 14, it talked about this very kind of thing. In Romans 14, 1 and 2, you have the introduction to the problem. One brother was weak in the faith. He believed he couldn't eat meat. One brother was strong. He rightly believed you could eat that meat. There was a command that was given. You receive one another. Why? 
because God had received that meat eater. In other words, the practice wasn't wrong in itself. Therefore, what do you do? You don't dispute about this matter. Didn't say you to continue on and you try to get that man who's weak to come over to your view. If you did, what good would it do? Does it help him that he's able to eat meat now? Not spiritually. Let him go on in the way that he is. Then there's a discussion that's given of those who are weak. That one who thinks it's wrong to eat meat and as a result of that eats herbs. He has that conscience scruple. It's not a part of God's law, but maybe he's come from a background, I think here it is, of a Jewish way, of various things, not only of the kind of meat, but also in the way that it was prepared. That would cause him to have a conscience against eating it. Well, that one who was weak in his conscience was to recognize that that meat that he applied Old Testament thinking to about it, that's how he had grew up, that wasn't the law of God any longer, and so he wasn't to demand that that man give up his meat. God had received it, and so now he's to receive that man as well. But then the other one is dealt with. In Romans chapter 14, the latter part of it, in the first two verses of chapter 15, that strong brother is dealt with. It's reaffirmed that eating that meat involved no sin inherently. But he was not to go ahead and do that in such a way that caused a stumbling block before the weak. In other words, that would cause him to eat that meat when he thought it was wrong. If you believe that it's sin, you do it in that doubt, you're condemned if you eat, if you eat Paul points out. And so what was that stronger brother to do? He was to recognize he had a liberty, exercise it in a way that did not cause damage to that weaker brother. He was instead supposed to bear those one's burdens. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10, you see the same principle. You see in chapter 8 and verse 4, one knows that an idol is nothing. In other words, he eats meat. That comes from that which is offered to an idol, not in worshiping the idol, but just because it's meat and it's sold in the market. Then there's also another who views that meat as involved in idol worship because he said it came from that idol's temple over there. What was supposed to be done? Both of them were to recognize the fact that one way or the other, neither practice was right or wrong in and of itself. It was something where both of those were all right. It was something that had to do with their conscience instead. That liberty then was not to be a stumbling block to your brother. And the fact is that there was an example that Paul gave himself. We know what chapter 9 is about in 1 Corinthians. Here Paul's saying, I become all things to all men that I might by all means what? Save some. In other words, it wasn't what he wanted to do. It was a practice where he subjected his own matters of opinion and matters of the custom to him to how it is that he was to live in a way that would build up the cause of Christ. Chapter 10, then he turns to that very practice. What happens if you go to have a meal at a place where there is the offering of meat that is from an idol? You eat what's set before you asking no questions for conscience sake. But then what happens? If the person says, you know, that was offered to an idol, then you don't eat. You still recognize there's nothing, whether a piece of meat has been offered to an idol and the idol was nothing or not, that didn't mean the meat was something that was tainted. But he says, then you don't eat. Not because of you, but because that other person who's going to take your eating as a matter of worship to the idol. He says, it may be a lawful matter to do, but in that place it wouldn't edify, it wouldn't build them up. Let that alone. That's not the issue. You can be one who goes on from that. Other matters need to be dealt with. Our liberty, he says, may be limited by one who's weakened to sin due to his wrong thought. 
other words, I may know I can eat that meat that's offered to an idol, but the idol isn't anything. I'm not worshiping that idol, and it does not inherently imply that. But here's somebody weak that I look at that I need to think of. Do I have to have that meat in order to serve God? No, sir. So what do I do? I put my right or liberty to do that aside in order to help that one and to try to win them to the cause of Christ. We need to understand when we look at the scripture, there are three areas of ideas of action of what we call authority. There's things that are required, baptism, the Lord's Supper, singing, receiving Gentiles, even uh, in Jew and Gentile, though they were divided in Old Testament times, they're not to be in this time. Those things are required. There's things that are forbidden, things like idolatry, fornication, lying, eating blood, various ones we could go into there. Those things are forbidden because God's law says not to. But there's a third area of things, the things that are allowed. And that's what's talked about in uh, Romans chapter 14 and in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. Things like circumcision, eating meats, observing days. Those have to do with matters that are there that are allowed. You know, matters of opinion cannot be in area one or two. Things required or things forbidden. Matters of conscience come in area three. Those things that are allowed by God, they're not inherently sinful, that we need to act accordingly with the result to them. I want to suggest to you in closing that what we need to do is maintain the bond of peace by all of us having proper attitudes, that is, submitting self to the commandments of God first. That God's will is what we look to. We submit self to serving others. We see that need to be one who's a servant. Jesus said if we're not servants of one another, we're not going to heaven. That's a serious matter, and we need to submit ourselves to one another. That we need to deny selfish desires for the good of the cause of Christ. And it also requires, if we're going to be those who maintain the bond of peace, that all of us act properly in areas of liberty or opinion or personal conscience. Not just in matters of the law of God, but of these things that have to do with our personal conscience. That is that we distinguish correctly between matters of doctrine and matters of opinion. That we recognize there is, an in, uh, there is a difference in practices that is inherently sinful and those that aren't inherently sinful. Well, let me expound on that just a moment. I didn't say that in my thought I know where this thing ends down the line. I said we need to distinguish between things that are inherently sinful and those that aren't. What I recognize as something coming from that, some action that comes from there, yes, that's a matter of wisdom, and I need to be one who's concerned about that, but that isn't a point of contention and division that we bring. We're looking at what it inherently is. The one with personal scruples, needs to recognize you ought not to bind those scruples upon others. The one without those scruples needs to seek to have his liberty put in check so as to help another brother's soul, to do all that he can in that way. You see, there's responsibilities on both sides of this. There's another thing that we need to recognize, and that is that we need to respect the leadership of elders in those matters of opinion. I say in matters of opinion simply because of this. Elders don't have a right to rule in a matter that God already ruled in in doctrine and change that. Where elders have a right of rule has to do with those matters that are right in themselves but not required and those things where we recognize a wrong that may be coming but it's not inherently wrong of what's involved right there. In Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 7, 
the statement is made there by the Hebrew writer, remember those who rule over you or had the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Why have we appointed the men elders that we have? Doesn't suggest that forever and ever they're going to be right in everything they do. If one goes involved in sin, 1 Timothy chapter 5 deals with that. There need to be a plurality of witnesses. They need to be dealt with. Then obviously they cannot be those who are elders among God's people from that point on. But we need to recognize that they are ones who have great wisdom and who have studied matters and who think about these things and probably have some judgments to give that we need to give a kind of attention to and give the benefit of the doubt in the idea of considering their wisdom in these things. Verse 17 then goes on to say, Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey those who have, present tense, the rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Here you have matters where someone is to submit to these elders. Why? Because he recognized they watch for your soul. And you know, in matters of an opinion, in matters that we have to deal with from time to time in a local congregation, we need to understand that those judgments that elders make are ones that it says we need to submit to. That doesn't say object. That doesn't say that we go out and we try to say, I don't think that was a good idea. I don't think it was wise. You can ask me all you want as to whether I agree with the judgment an elder made or the eldership made, rather. And you'll get one answer from me, and that is I'm going to submit to them because they have that right. They have that place. A lot of times there are brethren who have come along and have lived in such a way that instead of being under an eldership and submitting to them and recognizing why God gave that, that they instead have said, well, I'm the one who needs to have a place and I think what I'm doing is wiser than everybody else. If they'd sit down and think about that for a moment, they'd see that's a little bit of why God gave the direction that he did that you're talking about men who consider that from every side. And as a result of that, what happens? If unity prevails, each one of us must do our part. I know I'm over time, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to ask you to be with me just one more time. When we look at some of the things that have taken place in our country over the last year or so with regard to situation that comes from the coronavirus and the pandemic uh, that stated from it. I've seen something that has been true in every single church I know of. I've had many preaching brethren or elders from other places who've called me and they've told me about the things that are there. And in every single church I know of, there's been problems over this matter of what do we do in our assembly. Do we wear the mask, not wear the mask? Do we have this kind of a distancing that's here, or do we do this other thing? Are we to have singing or not to have singing? Are we to have services at all? Are we to have classes at all? And you know, the fact of it is, I think all of us need to back up and say, well, let's just think about this for a minute. Every one of those questions has to do with a matter of a judgment. Not a matter of God's law speaking about any of that anywhere that I know of. It has to do with a judgment that's made. Second, when we look at what governmental officials have given as guidelines, we recognize two problems on either end. One, there have been guidelines that have been given, like our governor and our mayor here in Oklahoma City, who pointed out these are guidelines. 
They are not going to be enforced upon churches. They're what we're going to ask you to do and recognize that there may be some problems you deal with there. There's others who have tried to make mandates and saying you can't sing or you can't meet with so many people. You've got to have one-tenth of the number uh, that your capacity would be for the building. Now think about those for just a moment. God gave government, Romans 13, to guide in realms that he had put to them. One of the things that our founding fathers noted from the First Amendment was that there would be no law that would be made that would restrict the practice of our religious choice. Now, when that was made, there's a recognition that government has an has a right to act in some areas and not to act in some areas. If government came along and said to us, you can't sing in your assemblies, that helps to spread the coronavirus. Well, I'm sorry. And I'm going to hope that no one is adversely affected by that, but I'm going to sing because that's what God directed. I don't have a choice about that, do you? You see, the fact is, I need to recognize I'm going to do what God says. Now, am I going to submit to the government that did that? Yeah. They say, I'm going to be thrown in jail for singing. So be it. I'm ready to go to jail. You know, I look and see something that we have here in this country, which many countries in the world don't have. I've been to places where people have been told, you don't assemble next week. If you do, we're going to kill you. They went on and assembled, would you? If they said you don't assemble because we're going to come back with a machine gun and we're going to mow you down, would you be there next week? Now, if I change that to say, if you were God, I hope all of us would. But uh, you change that and say, you don't sing. You don't come here because that's the law regarding a virus. What are you going to do? We need to think about some things with regard to their eternal impact. I've seen through the time of this pandemic more than I want to see of Christians who have strayed and they're no longer attending among the saints. And they say, well, I can do the same thing I can watch on TV. Let me tell you, if you're watching on TV and that's what you're saying, you're as wrong as you can be. Romans 10, or Hebrews chapter 10 points out the fact that you are to be edifying, building up, encouraging your brethren as you assemble together. That's what the scripture says. If government tells me I'm not able to do that or somehow I'm afraid to do that. Something's wrong with my spirituality. And I've got to think about that very seriously. I've been to the Philippines where I've been told we want you to wear a bulletproof vest if you go out to that area to preach. I've refused. And there's a reason. I don't go to those places anymore because they've become impossible to go into. But if I go doing that, then what am I doing? I'm showing some special fear of that. I'll recognize, no, I'm not going to take undue risk. But if it means I die for the cause of Christ, I don't have a problem with that. I'm at home sooner. That's not a dictate. And we need to get our priorities straight with regard to a virus as well. I don't have a side to choose on in the current political struggle over these things. I think both of them are outrageous. They need to get back and think about things. It's part of our political climate. But brethren, if we allow that to enter the people of God, we're making a grave mistake. We're dividing the cause of Christ over something that never should have been a divisive element at all. Sometimes I hear, well, we obey the government as long as it doesn't conflict with God's law. Think about that one for a moment, too. You and I are involved in a world in the U.S. where a law has already been passed. It's been on the books for a couple of decades. 
that if we stand and we say in a public assembly that homosexuality is an abomination, it's ungodly, it'll cause you to be condemned, what you've done is hate speech and it is something that you can go to prison for. Now, do I have to use those words? No, I don't have to. But I'm not going to submit to that law and act as if they have a regulation in an area where they do not. No, sir, I am not. I'm going to state that. If that means I go to jail, I go to jail. But we have to recognize something. We're used to a land in which there have been laws that we haven't had any problem obeying. And I want to challenge you to think about the fact what happens when there are laws, which there already are, that would challenge what's right? What are we going to do? One way or the other, we need to decide. What the elders have done is to act in a way that's tried to provide for the conscience of all. In other words, here's someone who says, I think I really need a mask. I think that's an act of love. I think that's something that I need to do to help others. That's fine. I encourage them to do that. So the elders. I need a little bit more of a space where there aren't others who are unmasked. That's right. Over there in that building, that's why that was provided for. But here comes along something, well, why can't we all just do that then? There are some who would have a conscience problem regarding things of what has been given as a mandate which should not be given. And that's a matter of conscience with them. Now here, if the elders make one thing mandatory, there's somebody over here that's going to have a problem with their conscience in that. I want to go public in saying this. I don't know of anything the elders here could have been done could have done that has been a wiser move than what they have to provide for people to stand of their own conscience themselves. I don't know of anything could have been done. It's not the mandating of something that would cause a problem with people's conscience, and believe me, they've heard from many on both sides of that. But they've acted in such a way as to say, you do what you think is right, and you do what you think is right that would be of good conscience to you. But the idea of a lack of love being there because they didn't say one way or the other, you have to do this, no, sir. That isn't there, it's just the opposite. It's a heart of love that's caused them to try to make every way possible so that brethren would not be in a matter that would violate their own conscience. I ask you to think about these things because the fact is there are difficulties that we have in this time and other congregations have in this time over these matters. There are also problems that are had that require some immediate attention. You know, when we worry about what happens in a tiny little skirmish of a fire over here and we're allowing a blaze in the living room, we've got a problem. There's always a problem with regard to doctrinal matters that are coming in to the people of God. The elders here are concerned about that and God bless them for being so. Please, let's help them. They watch for our souls. Let's help them to be those who would answer with joy and not with hardship. Because that's what our responsibility is as part of this congregation. The lesson's yours. Maybe that there's one who needs to respond to the gospel's call. We haven't talked about first principles this morning. But if you know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you're ready to come with that faith, repenting of your sins, and confess that faith before men were ready to help you, to baptize you into Christ that you might live in a new life.
if you've done that, that you've turned from that path, in some way you've gone away from the Lord and you need to come back to Him, we're ready to help you in that as well, praying for you and with you, that everything possible might be there to strengthen and to edify you, that you might be not only forgiven of sins, but more determined in the future to live as you ought to live. If you need to respond to the gospel's call, we hope you will while we stand and sing.